Good morning. Rich Savell here. I want to give you an update on the 2015 ACLS guidelines. Number one, vasopressin is no longer in the ACLS guidelines. The specific wording is that the combined use of vasopressin and epinephrine offers no advantage to using standard dose epinephrine in cardiac arrest. Also, vasopressin does not offer an advantage over the use of epinephrine alone. Therefore, to simplify the algorithm, vasopressin has been removed from the Adult Cardiac Arrest Algorithm 2015 update. Number two, there's a focus on the use of entitled CO2 as a tool to help make an assessment about the duration and potential termination of compressions during CPR. And their specific wording is that low end tidal CO2 in intubated patients after 20 minutes of CPR is associated with a very low likelihood of resuscitation. While this parameter should not be used in isolation for decision making, providers may consider low end tidal CO2 after 20 minutes of CPR in combination with other factors to help determine when to terminate resuscitation. Number three, and this one I think is really interesting. There was a study in JAMA published in 2013 from Greece looking at adding steroids to in-house cardiac arrest, in-hospital cardiac arrest, and there was an improvement in outcomes. And this was a study published in JAMA called Vasopressin Steroids and Epinephrine and Neurologically Favorable Survival After In-Hospital Cardiac Arrest, a randomized clinical trial by Mensalopoulos et al. They looked at 268 patients and they randomized them to either receiving standard therapy for CPR or standard therapy plus methylprednisolone 40 milligrams during the code and that if they were in shock afterwards, they were given stress dose steroids. And the specific protocol was that they were given 300 milligrams of hydrocortisone daily for seven days with gradual taper. And there was significant improvements in outcomes, and you can see the paper for more details. But because of that, the wording uh, here is that steroids may provide some benefit when bundled with vasopressin and epinephrine in treating in-hospital cardiac arrest. While routine use is not recommended pending follow-up studies, it would be reasonable for a provider to administer the bundle for in-hospital cardiac arrest. Number four, there's a mention of incorporating ECMO, extracorporeal CPR, into CPR, but that it should be chosen carefully. Their specific wording is, when rapidly implemented, eCPR can prolong viability as it may provide time to treat potentially reversible conditions or arrange for cardiac transplantation for patients who are not resuscitated by conventional CPR. But they also mention that this is quite uh, resource intensive and should be chosen very carefully. Number five, in patients, I'm sorry, in cardiac arrest patients with non-shockable rhythm and who you would be giving epinephrine to normally, they recommend that early provision is, uh, of epinephrine is suggested. And the specific wording here is that because of a large observational study of cardiac arrest with non-shockable rhythm compared epinephrine at one to three minutes with epinephrine given at three uh, later time intervals, four to six, seven to nine, and greater than nine minutes, <clears throat> The study found an association between early administration of epinephrine and increased return of spontaneous circulation, survival to hospital discharge, and neurologically intact survival. Number six is referring to lidocaine, and because there was some data that it may have actually been harmful, but newer data that it appears to be uh, potentially beneficial, the focused wording is as follows. Studies about the use of lidocaine after return of spontaneous circulation are conflicting and routine lidocaine use is not recommended. However, the initiation or continuation of lidocaine may be considered immediately after return of, return of spontaneous circulation from VFib, pulseless VTAC, cardiac arrest. And again, a little backup here is that while earlier studies showed an association between giving lidocaine after myocardial infarction and increased mortality, a recent study of lidocaine in cardiac arrest survivors showed a decrease in the incidence of recurrent VF pulseless VTAC, but did not show either long-term benefit 
or harm. And then finally, and interestingly, again, the role of beta blockers after in a patient who survives cardiac arrest. And their specific wording is as follows. One observational study suggests that beta blocker use after cardiac arrest may be associated with better outcomes than when beta blockers are not used. Although this observational study is not strong enough evidence to recommend routine use, the initiation or continuation of an oral or intravenous beta blocker may be considered early after hospitalization from cardiac arrest due to VFib and pulseless VTAC. And the little bit of background here is very similar. In an observational study of patients who had return of spontaneous circulation after VF, pulseless VT, cardiac arrest, beta blocker administration was associated with higher survival rates. However, this finding is only an associative relationship, and the routine use of beta blockers after cardiac arrest is potentially hazardous because beta blockers can cause or worsen hemodynamic instability, exacerbate heart failure, and cause Brady arrhythmias. Therefore, providers should evaluate patients individually for their suitability for beta blockers. Alrighty, there you have it. Thanks for listening. Be strong, stay focused. See you later.